I was listed uh, on the online of the biography that uh, said I was a design missionary. That's a bit lofty. I'm really more of something like a streetwalker. I spend a lot of time in urban areas looking for design and studying design in the public sector. I take about 5,000 photographs a year, and I thought that I would edit from these and try to come up with some images that might be appropriate and interesting to you. And I used uh, uh, three criteria. The first was I thought I'd talk about real design within reach, uh, design that's free, not design not quite within reach, as we're fondly known by our competition and competitors. But stuff that you can find on the streets, stuff that was free, stuff that was available to all people, and stuff that probably contained some other important messages. I'll use these sidewalks in Rio as an example. Very common public design done in the 50s. It's got a nice kind of flowing, organic form, uh, very consistent with the Brazilian culture. I think good design adds to, to culture. Wholly inconsistent with San Francisco or New York. But I think these are my sort of information highways. I live in much more of an analog world where pedestrian traffic and interaction and diversity uh, exchange and where I think the simple things under our feet have a great amount of meaning um, to us. How did I get started in this business? I was a ceramic designer for about 10 years and just loved utilitarian form, simple things that we use every day, little compositions of color and surface on form. This led me to starting a company called Design Within Reach, a company dealing with simple forms, making good design available to us, and also selling the personalities and character of the designers as well. And it seems to have, have worked. A couple years into the process, I spent a lot of time in Europe traveling around, looking for design. And I had a bit of a wake-up call in Amsterdam. I was there going to the design stores and mixing with our crowd of designers. And I recognized that a whole lot of stuff pretty much looked the same. And the effect of globalization has had that in our community also. We know a lot about what's going on with design around the world. And it's getting increasingly more difficult to find design that reflects a unique culture. I was walking around on the streets of Amsterdam, and I recognized you know, the big story from Amsterdam isn't what's in the design stores, it's what's out on the streets. And, and maybe it's self-explanatory, but a city that hasn't been uh, taken over by modernism, uh, that's preserved its kind of architecture and character, and where the bicycle plays an important part of the way in which people get around and where pedestrian rights are, are protected. And I, I write a newsletter that goes out every week, and I wrote an article about this and got such enormous response that I realized that design, the common design that's in the public area, uh, means a lot to people and establishes kind of a groundwork and, and a dialogue. I uh, then kind of thought about the other cities in Europe where I spend a lot of time in looking for design, like Basel, where Vitra is located, or in, in northern Italy, all cities where there are a whole lot of bicycles and where pedestrian areas are. And I came to the conclusion that perhaps there was something about these important <coughs> design centers that dealt with bicycles and foot traffic. And I'm sure the skeptic I would say, no, the correlation there is that there, there are universities and schools where people can't afford cars. But it, it did seem that in many of these areas, pedestrian uh, traffic was protected. Uh, you wouldn't look at this and call this a designer bike. A designer bike is made of titanium or molybdenum. But I began looking at design in a place like Amsterdam and recognized, you know, the first job of design is to serve a social purpose. And so I look at this bike as not being uh, a designer bike, but being a very good example of design. And since that time in Amsterdam, I spent an increasing amount of time in the cities looking at design and uh, for, for common evidence of design that, that really isn't under so much of a designer signature. I was in Buenos Aires very recently and uh, went to see this bridge by Santiago Calatrava. He's a Spanish architect and designer. And the, the tourist brochures pointed me in the direction of this bridge. I love bridges metaphorically and, and symbolically and structurally. And uh, it was a bit of a disappointment because of the sludge from the river was encrusted on it. It really wasn't in use. And I, and I recognize that oftentimes design, when you're set up to see design, it can be a bit of a letdown. But there were um, uh, lots of other things going on in this area. It was a kind of construction zone. A lot of buildings were going up. And uh, approaching a building from a distance, you don't see too much. You get a little closer, and you arrive at a nice little composition that might remind you of a Mondrian or a demon corn or something. But to me, it was an example of industrial materials with a little bit of color, some animation, and a nice little still life, kind of an unintended piece of design. And going a little closer, uh, you get a different perspective. I find these little vignettes, these little accidental pieces of design um, uh, to be refreshing. They give me, um, I don't know, a sense of correctness in the, in the world and some visual delight. 
and uh, the knowledge that the building will probably never look as good as this simple uh, industrial scaffolding that is there to, to serve. Down the road, there was another building, a nice, a nice visual structure, horizontal vertical elements, little decorative lines going across these magenta squiggles, the, the workmen being reduced to decorative elements, just a nice kind of breakup of the urban place. And you know, that, that's, that no longer exists. You've captured it for a moment. And finding this little still life's like, listening to little songs or something gives me an enormous amount of, of pleasure. Antoine Predock designed a wonderful ball stadium in, in San Diego called uh, Petco Park, a terrific use of local materials. But inside, you could find some interior compositions. Some people go to baseball stadiums to see games. I go and see uh, design relationships. Just a wonderful kind of breakup of architecture and the way that the trees form vertical elements. Red is a color in the landscape that, that uh, is often on stop signs. It takes your attention as a great amount of motion. It stares back at you the way that a, uh, that a figure might. Just a piece of barrier tape, construction stuff in, in Italy. Construction site in New York, a red having this kind of emotional power that's almost an equivalent with the way in which cuteness of puppies and such. Side street in, in Italy, uh, red drew me into this little composition, optimistic to me in the sense that maybe the, the public services mailbox, door service, plumbing, it looks as if these different public services work together to create some nice little compositions. In Italy, you know, almost everything kind of looks good. Simple menus, put on a board, achieving kind of this sort of balance. But I'm convinced that it's because you're walking around in the streets and seeing things. Red can be comical, it can draw your attention to the poor little personality of the little fire hydrant suffering from bad civic planning in Havana. Color can animate simple blocks, simple materials. Walking in, in New York, I'll stop. I don't always know why I'm taking photographs of things. A nice visual composition of symmetry, curves against sharp things. It's a comment on the way in which we deal with public seating in the city of New York. I'll come across some other just kind of curious relationships of bollards on the street that, that have different interpretations, but these things amuse me. <laughs> Sometimes a trash can, this is just in the street in San Francisco, a trash can that's been left there for 18 months creates a nice 45 degree angle against these other relationships and turns a common parking spot into a nice little piece of sculpture. So there's this sort of silent hand of design at work that I see in places that, that I go. Havana is a wonderful area. It's quite free of commercial clutter. You don't see our, our logos and brands and names and, and therefore you're alerted to things physically. And this is a great... Uh, uh, protection of a pedestrian zone and the repurposing of some colonial cannons to do that. And <laughs> Cuba needs to be far more resourceful because of the blockades and things, but a really wonderful playground. I've often wondered why Italy is really a leader in modern design. In, in our area, in furnishings, they're sort of way at the top. The Dutch are good also, but the Italians will do that. And I came across this little street in, in Venice where the communist headquarters were sharing a wall with this Catholic shrine. And I realized that, you know, Italy is a place where they can, they can accept these different I ideologies and deal with diversity and not have the problem, or they can choose to ignore them. But, but these, these, you don't have warring factions, and I think that maybe the tolerance of the absurdity uh, which has made Italy um, um, so innovative and, and so tolerant. The past and the present work quite well together in Italy also. And I think that it's recognizable there and has an important effect on culture because their public spaces are protected, their sidewalks are protected, and you're actually able to confront these things um, physically. And I think this helps people get over their fear of modernism and other such things. A change might be a typical street corner in, in San Francisco. And, and I use this, this is sort of what I consider to be urban spam. I notice the stuff because I, I walk a lot, but here private industry is really kind of making a mess of, of the public sector. And as I look at this, you know, the publications that report on problems in the urban area also contribute to it. And I, I, it's just my call to say all of us, um, public policy won't change this, that all private industry has to work to uh, take things like this seriously. The extreme might be in Italy where, again, this kind of some type of control over what's happening in the environment is very evident, even in the way that they sell and distribute periodicals. I uh, walk to work every day or ride my scooter. I come down and, and park in this little spot. And I came down one day and all the bikes were red. Now, this is not going to impress you guys who Photoshop and, and can do stuff, but this was an actual um, a moment when I got off my bike and I looked and I thought it's, it's, it's as if all of my uh, uh, biker brethren had kind of gotten together and conspired to, to make a, a little statement. 
And it reminded me that um, um, to keep in the present, to, to, to look out for these kinds of things. It gave me possibilities to wonder if it's, maybe it's a yellow day in San Francisco and we could all uh, agree and create some, um, um, some installations. But it also reminded me of the power of pattern and repetition to make an effect in our mind. And I don't know if there's a stronger kind of effect than, than, than pattern in the way that it unites kind of disparate elements. I was at the art show in Miami in December and spent a couple hours looking at fine art and amazed at, at the prices of art and you know, how expensive it is, but, but having a great time looking at it. And I came outside and the, the valets for this car service had created you know, quite a nice little collage of these car keys. And my closest equivalent were a group of prayer tags that I had seen in, in Tokyo. And I thought that if pattern can unite these disparate elements. It can do just about anything. I don't have very many shots of people because they kind of get in the way of studying a pure form. I was in a, a small restaurant in, um, in Spain having lunch, one of those nice days where you had the place kind of to yourself and you're having a glass of wine and enjoying the local area and the culture and, and the food and the quiet and feeling very lucky. And a busload of tourists arrive emptied out, uh, filled up the restaurant in a, in a very short period of time, completely changed the atmosphere and, and character with, with loud voices and large bodies and such. And we had to get up and leave. It was just that, that uncomfortable. And at that moment, the sun came out and through this perforated screen, pattern was cast over these bodies and they kind of faded into the rear. And we left the restaurant kind of feeling um, okay about stuff. And, uh, uh, I, I do think pattern has the capability of eradicating some of um, the most evil, evil forces of society, such as bad form in restaurants. But quite seriously, <laughs> it, was, it was a statement to me that what, one thing that you do sort of see is the aggressive nature of, of, of the industrial world has produced kind of um, uh, large masses of, of things and, and and um, uh, when you, and, and monoculture, and I think the preservation of diversity and culture is something that's important to us. The last shots that, that I have deal with uh, coming back to this theme of sidewalks, and, and uh, I wanted to say something here about, I'm, I'm kind of optimistic, you know, post uh, Second World War, uh, the influence of the automobile um, has really been devastating on a lot of our cities. A lot of urban areas have been converted into to parking lots and was sort of indiscriminate use. A lot of the planning departments became subordinated to the transportation departments. It's as easy to rag on cars as it is on Walmart. I'm not, I'm not gonna do that. But there are real examples in, in, in urbanization and the change that's occurred in the last number of years and the heightened sensitivity to the importance of our urban environments as cultural centers. I think that they are, that the statements that we make in this public sector um, are our um, contributions to um, um, a larger whole uh, cities are the place where we're most likely to encounter diversity and, and to mix with, with other people. We go there for stimulation and art and all these other things. But I think people have recognized the, the sanctity of our urban areas. A place like Chicago has really reached kind of a level of international stature. The U.S. is actually becoming a bit of a leader in kind of enlightened urban planning and, and renewal. And I wanted to single out a place like Chicago, where, where I look at some guy like Mayor Daley as a bit of a design hero for being able to work through the political processes and all that to improve an area. You would expect a city like this to have upgraded flower boxes on Michigan Avenue where, where wealthy people shop. But if you actually go along the street, you find that the flower boxes change from street to street. There's actual diversity in the plants. And the idea that a city crew can maintain different types of foliage is, is um, really quite, quite exceptional. There are common elements of this that you'll see throughout Chicago. And then there are your big D design statements, the Pritzker uh, Pavilion done by Frank Gehry. My measure of this as being an important bit of design is not so much the way that it looks, but the fact that it performs a very important social function. There are a lot of free concerts, for example, that go on in, in this area. It has a phenomenal acoustic system. But the commitment that the city has made to the public area is significant and almost an international model. I, I work on the Mayor's Council in San Francisco on the international 
National Design Council for Mayors, and Chicago has looked at the pinnacle, and, and I really would like to salute Mayor Daley and the folks there. I thought that I should include at least one shot of technology for you guys. This is also in Millennium Park in Chicago, where the Spanish artist designer Plinza has created kind of a, a digital readout in this park that reflects back the character and personalities of, of, of the people um, in this area. And it's a welcoming area, I think inclusive of diversity, reflective of diversity, and I think this marriage of both technology and art in the public sector is an area where the U.S. can really take a leadership role, and Chicago is one example. Thank you very much.